So uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, a bit of research that I've been doing for this uh, role-playing game I've been designing that's called Mirio to Politics. Uh, that's uh, basically for sort of simulating and prototyping planetary scale scenarios on uh, 21st century Earth. Um, you might ask, what is this pretentious word? Uh, well, it's a portmanteau of muriology, topology, and politics. Uh, muriology is the theory of parthood relations, so it's essentially parts, holes, uh, their relationships, and boundaries. <coughs> topology is, without getting into semantics on uh, set and category theory, it's essentially like the study of surfaces. And then uh, politics is, of course, the decision-making process for sort of achieving and exercising positions and governance. So this is a, a, a world game about the, the politics of parthood and, and wholeness on a, a surface, a sphere in this case, uh, Earth uh, most specifically. So politics, when, when it's distilled, is, is really about resource allocation. Um, and resource games often tend towards war dynamics. Um, but the question I want to ask during this uh, talk is, uh, do all resource games uh, result in, in war games? Uh, war games have, have uh, evolved uh, their form throughout the ages. Uh, recent incarnations uh, embody uh, John von Neumann's game theory of economic behavior and military strategy that is uh, practiced in the, the brain trusts of the RAND Corporation and the Pentagon. And, and beyond, and we'll talk more about some of the other organizations doing that later. Uh, um, these, these militarists attempt to pre-experience and uh, pre-experience the probabilities and consequences of world war by using game theory in terms of optimum logistics and ballistic strategies. Um, of course, game theory is predicated on the axiomatic assumption that it's either us or them, that uh, there's not enough world resources to support humanity, and consequently, only the fittest survive. Um, these scarcity economics rest on the assumption uh, put forth by the 19th century social Darwinist uh, Thomas Malthus, uh, who held that humanity is multiplying much more rapidly than it can supply resources to support itself. Um, can we discard this Malthusian doctrine, uh, which is the sort of present assumption of the, of the nation state? Um, it, it compounds with, with Darwin's survival of the fittest to assume that uh, only the side with the arms uh, can survive. So someone who was willing to challenge this assumption uh, was uh, Buckminster Fuller when he put forth his world game, his, or world peace game at the uh, uh, Expo 67 and, and the, the World Fair in Montreal. And uh, the, the best synopsis or the problem statement around this was uh, make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. It's still like my favorite problem statement and, uh, and it's more relevant than ever. Uh, world game was a giant world logistics game that uh, was played by individuals and groups all around the world using uh, computer programs based on principles of anticipatory design science, game theory, general systems theory, um, and input-output equilibrium theory. Um, Fuller, Fuller compiled a, a comprehensive, an extremely comprehensive, over a thousand page engineering and research dossier that included uh, global productivity analysis, engine, en energy and resource consumption projections, uh, economic vector plots and the ecological thresholds for um, for the planet. Um, he organized workshops for brokering and designing global concord and uh, resource distribution mechanisms. So essentially, the game is uh, a game where everyone wins. It's not non-zero sum and results in a, a desovereignization of, of nation states. Um, if you don't know Bucky, he's an architect, system theorist, author, and designer, inventor, and futurist remarkable person, uh, human being. Um, look him up if you don't know him. Um, but as obvious as it may seem, why didn't the world game work? Uh, should, should it all be abandoned? Is it actually war games all the way down? Uh, are we stuck in this Hobbesian anarchy of war, uh, war against all, of all against all? Uh, no. Uh, Fuller scientifically demonstrated that this does not have to be the case. Um, it's been 50 years since Fuller's proposition, and, and while the problem remains unresolved, and the statement is more relevant than ever, um, I'm not going to be the 
vanilla Buckminster Fuller utopianist that's visiting from San Francisco to harp on uh, basically a failed method at solving uh, the tragedy of the commons problem. Um, so I want to move forward with a quote by James P. Carse. Uh, a finite game is for the purpose of winning, and an infinite game is for the purpose of continuing to play. So quick little bit about me. My background is in music composition. I work as a systems architect uh, and do spatial media design for la large and basically urban scale architectural landscape uh, uh, infrastructure design, working on project called MSG Sphere, which is a 24 story diameter spherical arena for immersive media and esports. I've done a, a, a number of years work in, in China and in the media landscape, I've worked in some, some of the smart cities, including Mazdar in uh, the Emirates. And um, next year we're gonna be doing the World Fair in Dubai with a, a 300 meter uh, circle pack dome um, instead of it being a geodesic dome. Uh, which is sort of based off of Buckminster Fuller's uh, uh, concepts of uh, synergetics. Um, so there's this theme in here that's uh, around spheres, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, uh, I want to talk about uh, parts and holes, uh, so muriology. Um, I, I'm still not certain how I, uh, uh, where I'm positioned in all of this, but uh, Buckminster Fuller puts forth a whole systems theory where you start with the universe, you sort of begin with the whole and you differentiate it, segment it into, into parts. Um, complex systems analysis, uh, analysts um, with agent-based modeling and, and cryptoeconomics and permaculture and uh, emergent designers um, posit that uh, you start with the parts and you work up to a whole. Um, want to find some commonalities here um, because I find both methods um, are, are, are viable for, for different types of solutions and, and whole systems. Uh, commonalities are sort of the typological sets uh, uh, and, and not using uh, taxonomy, uh, hierarchical taxonomies, uh, and then of course mechanics and mechanisms and heuristics to sort of describe the system's behavior. Um, of course, when you're describing a system's behavior, it is not the system itself, so we're... Uh, um, we're constantly making models to, to describe these, these systems. And so, um, you know, the science is an obvious way, or is an obvious method that we, that we sort of use to, to create models. And uh, this positions itself outside of, of things. It's sort of a non-ecological position. Uh, um, in world gaming, uh, we look down on Spaceship Earth uh, with, with satellites as our prosthetic eyes to, to sort of realize that there are no externalities. This is also how uh, utopian design is done, where uh, you have this sort of segregated island, uh, classically, where, uh, um, yeah, you have a carte blanche. Um, problem with this, uh, epistemologically and methodologically, is that, uh, well, it's, it's, I think the problem is best described by, by the statistician George Box when he says that all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, so when we're doing modeling and mapping and simulation and describing whole systems and their behavior, we run into these these problems of like like skeuomorphism, uh, scoping issues, um, sort of boundary definitions. Uh, resolution is is uh, always an issue. Uh, translation and truncation errors, and then um, of course externalities. Um, and in our efforts to make models, we we often are forced to make distinctions. Uh, um, boundaries and borders, and in geospatial terms, we, we uh, end up with zero-sum architectural formations. Uh, so, when this happens, uh, well, I, I, since this has been happening, I think architecture, and I can speak firsthand here, is, is, has really like lost sight of its narrative and, and possibly its its future, sort of becoming purely an expression and an instrument of, of power, and, and hence war. Uh, Corbusier once said that. Uh, we have to choose between revolution and architecture, and you know, depending on your position on historical materialism, uh, revolution is it, it may not be, may or may not be integrative or world game like. Um, so we have uh, sort of like this this war game like architecture, which right now seems to be tending towards free trade without free migration. Um, uh, I like to think about maybe a, a world game architecture, which which inverts that uh, is thinking more about free migration uh, with a sort of regionalized production. Um, and yeah, again, sort of as these new type of uh, uh, disproportionate parthoods emerge in, in 21st century geopolitics, 
um, that are sort of examples of these, these types of things would be Singapore, Chinese economic zones, neo cities in the Emirates, uh, Hong Kong, Kenya, and uh, uh, the US will soon be working this way too with its newly minted special economic zones and the tax code. <laughs> Um, uh, and so this idea of, of uh, that was postulated by uh, Felix Guattari and uh, elaborated upon by B. Uh schizoanalytic cartography, uh, where we see sort of the segmentation and the striation of space, um, is, it seems to be the, this, the, the tendency towards these new types of f formations. Um, so this, when we talk about whole systems health, um, uh, we can't ignore the subsystems. Uh, uh, that are sort of resulting in this type of organ formation. Um, there's an old Vedic question uh, that asks where where does the body end? Um, and sort of extrapolating this out to the subject matter of the talk, um, where does the self or the the system end? Um, we end up often with this uh, these sort of dyadic or dialectical distinctions where uh, we have self and non-self in the Vedic question, Atman and Anatman. Um, uh, but in the West, we have this sort of nature-culture divide, this rural-urban, this inside-outside, and, of course, uh, body and mind. Um, uh, and in the war game dynamic, we have us and them. So um, war games uh, do, do this type, these, make these types of distinctions by uh, uh, rationalizing play space to make it computable. Um, th this evolves from Chaturgana, an Indian uh, proto-chess game, Patia in Greece, uh, developing into chess, and then Kriegspiel here in Germany, and then developing into game theory and, and beyond. Um, these, these sort of deterministic war game spaces um, and, and, and closed systems um, really aren't games. Uh, like, for example, uh, a von Neumann quote that says, chess is not a game. Chess is a, a well-defined form of computation. It is solvable where there is a right procedure in any position. Real games just don't, don't work like that. So um, the Pentagon-funded strategist for the Cold War, the Rand Corporation, um, put forth the idea of sort of replacing generals as uh, the primary military strategists, uh, um, replacing them with economists, mathematicians, computer scientists, sociologists, physicists. You know, uh, people who uh, historically were not uh, driving militaries, um, but uh, to sort of move beyond the, the inadequacies of, of, of military modeling for the new types of war that were emerging. Um, uh, Rand, Rand physicist Herman Kahn, who uh, Dr. Strangelove was modeled off of when, when being uh, uh, prompted by uh, old military generals uh, who were irked by, by his presence in the, in the war rooms, he asked uh, how many thermonuclear wars have you fought recently? Sort of pointing towards the uh, uh, new types of war that, that, that were being stated. Um, so all of, all of this sort of computation is sort of predicated on this idea of a payoff matrix uh, and payoff matrices. Uh, um, the prisoner's dilemma is the most obvious one, um, uh, which, which basically, uh, creates uh, behavioral prediction models uh, sort of under controlled sets of circumstances where you have these, these matrices that, uh, where, where things like Nash equilibria and mutually assured destruction are, are used to sort of bind and predict agents' behaviors within, within a system. Um, Rand economist Thomas Schelling pointed out that the, the low resolution uh, payoff matrix was highly deterministic and, and, and inefficacious at, at modeling deep decision space. And, um, and, and, and reality is really too complex and, and affords agents uh, many permutations that exceed the model and, and are hence uh, really not, not useful. Um, this sort of points towards uh, what Turing refers to as the, the incomputable. Um, here we have the, the Johari quadrant, which is uh, uh, emerged, in, uh, emerged during uh, asymmetric warfare, which um, again, sort of moves on this, this thing that Schelling was describing. It talks about the, the uh, infinite permutations of possibility and, uh, and finite in information that was available to, to the agents. Um, you know, this is sort of the end to the end power, power matrix. Um, again, sort of Turing's incomputable and uh, what Rumsfeld referred to in the, in the Iraq War famously as, as the unknown unknowns. Uh, so... 
how did the, how, how did the war games uh, evolve? Well, they evolved into chains of matrices, uh, probabilities, pattern recognition, and sort of extrapolation based on, on recalculating current game state. Um, watching the evolution of um, Deep Blue beat Kasparov, um, AlphaGo just, re just recently uh, beating the, the world uh, Go champion, um, uh, now moving into more, more complex decision spaces like StarCraft uh, with its eyes set on, uh, with its sights set on, on reality, of course. You know, where we have game theory, which is sort of too vague in this sort of intractable problem space, and simulations being too specific in this, in this tractable space, war sort of um, oscillates and interpolates between these, these problem spaces, uh, where the optimal strategy is ultimately optionality, sort of keeping the table open. Um, so this, this 40 chess, if you will, sort of uh, presents itself where power becomes preemption um, and the ability to uh, preempt. Um, this anti-rigidity is, is summed up perfectly in uh, uh, General Dwight D. Eisenhower's quote saying, uh, plans are worthless, planning is everything. Um, as war games evolved uh, into these dynamic probabilistic systems, um, world gaming moved into closed systems and, and collapse. Um, <laughs> We see Biosphere 1 and 2 here, um, which both uh, ended in, in calamity. Um, these attempts to be separate and disconnected and non-ecological um, ultimately uh, ended in, in their demise. Um, the sort of baby boomer Buckminster at Fuller acolytes did not design whole systems. This uh, think global, act local uh, folk politics doesn't work because it doesn't scale up. Um, there's also another another critique uh, from uh, uh, Marxist Richard Barbrook, uh, where he discusses the California ideology in, in, in this essay, where he, he says that the, these, this type of thinking follows sort of a Jeffersonian democracy um, st stemming from colonialism, uh, frontiersmanship, and, and secession, um, most recently developing into sort of the te techno-libertarian ideology. Uh, F Fuller believed that, that games could replace politics um, but I think, I think Fuller had somewhat of an inadequate comprehension of, of games, as ingenious as he was. Um, when you don't have politics, you don't have threat modeling, and um, you become susceptible to adversaries in real politic. Um, I think this, the, when you look at Biosphere 2 being um, uh, ultimately destroyed by uh, Stephen Bannon, um, we see a fatal flaw here in trying to implement the, this type of world game. Um, so again, returning to uh, sort of the, the, the 21st century geospatial uh, uh, formations that are happening, we have, of course have uh, rhizomes, we're all familiar with these, the sort of network type of structure as an analogy for, for how this is um, sort of happening in architectural uh, space. Um, what I find more kinship with is uh, Peter Sloterdijk's phones. Uh, where he, he talks about spheres that sort of immunize and interiorize. These are effectively open systems with agency. Uh, uh, these sort of heterotopias that are, are pluralist systems uh, of, of opening and closing that are both isolated yet penetrable. Um, for Sloterdijk, architecture becomes an agent, uh, or it becomes a positive and active agent of isolation. Uh, instead of architecture as a tool to power, architecture is an instrument to create new social ecologies that weren't there before. Uh, for, of course, on the inverse, we have Rem Koolhaas, who suggests that where there is architecture, nothing is possible. But Sloterdijk, however, suggests that when we design positive spheres of, of isolation for different possibilities of, of being in the world, um, and again, coming back to modeling, modeling, models require edges, and for proofs, you, you, you need boundary definitions. So uh, when we talk about boundaries, it can get really hairy, especially as we're talking about this this century. Um, so how do we design enclosures without being exclusive? How do we design flexible boundaries um, and, and uh, make sure that they're interconnected? Um, I'm a huge fan of the sort of integrative autopoetic positive enclosures, uh, sort of nested systems uh, in, in um, Lynn Margulis who developed, who co-developed the, the Gaia theory. Um, uh, this, this concept of endosymbiogenesis, which is a valid evolutionary theory uh, of selection's reliance on the phenomenon of symbiosis, which simply is uh, 
Life didn't take over the globe by combat, but by, by networking. Um, this system has, has mechanisms for sharing resources across the entire system. It's evolutionarily stable, according to game theoretic economic analysis. And um, I think uh, this model afford, could, could afford system designers a sort of a functional model to, to mount and metabolize a current paradigm rather, uh, rather than war against it. That's sort of a revolution or a, a combat or a metastasize. Um, endosymbionts uh, live within the body, Gaia, uh, or cells of, of another organism in, in a symbiotic relationship with the, the host body or cell. Um, so that's a po those are positive enclosures. We all, we're, I hate to return to these negative in, uh, architectural enclosures where um, architecture uh, is expressed as war. Um, I think uh, Keller Easterling uh, has has really developed the, the, these ideas of in, in her in her concepts of extra statecraft. Um, these the neo cities are, are really this sort of advantageous war position. This uh, sort of McKinsey style management consultants, which are ultimately the, the the most recent practitioners of the latest iterations in the evolution of war gaming, which manifests as. As, as corporate strategy, um, are developing these types of nested sovereignties that have this isomorphic disposition, um, this closed loop deterministic districted architecture. Think like airports, tech campuses, business resorts as, as uh, examples of these types of formations. Um, where laws are treated more like uh, chain condition circumstances uh, that occur at sort of like protocol layers of the city. Um, and how the corporate externalities uh, are sort of exported to the developing world. Eff effectively, not whole systems thinking. These are design methods to avoid, uh, avoid uh, type of revising these types of designs. So um, another, uh, another James P. Carr's quote that says, finite players play within boundaries, infinite players play with boundaries. So uh, just as wargaming uses th these sort of spatial protocols to control regional boundaries, world gaming can and should leverage rules and protocols to form play dynamics rather than control parameters. Um, the first renditions of the world game uh, failed ultimately because its rules in singular win state were, were inflexible, prescriptive, and, and unadaptive, um, ultimately making it fragile and, and prone to a whole systems failure. World gaming uh, needs to learn how to fractionalize its goals into recalculable win states um, in what complexity theorists call a, sort of a dancing landscape. Um, so I like uh, referencing uh, Christopher Alexander's pattern languages that sort of can operate as sort of a distributed system for localizing responsibility uh, as, as part of a, a larger system. Um, I think it's imperative to design non-prescriptive architecture when we're designing play spaces to uh, afford emergence. Um, a, a wonderful Christopher Alexander quote here that whole, I think whole systems designers and world game players should consider. Set up a playground for the children in each neighborhood. Not a highly finished playground with asphalt and swings, but a place, where, but a place with raw materials of all kinds. Nets, boxes, barrels, trees, ropes, simple tools, frames, grass, and water where children can create and recreate playgrounds of their own, uh, where we're sort of designing systems with typologies uh, as heuristics, sort of bridges, not walls. Um, so unlike this type of Luddic, Luddic pattern language, um, war games posit architecture as, as player versus player, sort of have, haves and have-nots, um, where we have uh, ecology as player versus environment. And so the long position of war games is ultimately against nature. Um, and in war games, purely fitness-based model of quote-unquote winning, uh, epiphenomena, ecological and environmental phenomena are not factors in the war games. Uh, finite games, these, these finite games rest upon this fallacious assumption uh, of an infinitely regenerative ecology. Uh, in its war on nature, its account of the environment is as an adversary. Uh, and ultimately, this is an unwinnable position. Uh, and, and hence, I, I see this as its, its strategic weakness. So uh, world gaming plays with nature to continue playing an infinite game. Um, so we need to uh, redefine this winning at all costs, this uh, 
empty promise of, of winning total war at the end of history, the sort of end of dialectics that was pronounced in this Cold War dictum of after total war can come total living. Uh, <laughs> Uh, total war is this Cold War stalemate, this Nash equilibrium stasis that is uh, pronounced in terms of, of Pyrrhic victory, where the only way to win is not to play. Uh, and after the war, communism was deemed to be won, or was deemed, sorry, after, after the war against quote unquote communism uh, was deemed to be won, the economic warfare was turned uh, upon the agents of the, the capitalist system itself. Um, environments that are characterized by game dynamics are no more artificial than their non-game counterparts. Instead, games are yet another interface for, for reality. The practice of playing games is an escaped reality just like school, the workplace, or uh, any of the other environments in which we spend most of our time. Like the aforementioned foam and bubble-like enclosures, uh, the space of games distorts and simplifies a broader enveloping reality to make certain practical purposes seem achievable. Institutions, ideologies, and games are all escaped realities in the sense that they, like software, simplify a universe that is too complex and overwhelming to apprehend directly. The formalized rules and rituals that characterize all these environments help streamline and orient expertise at the expense of a broader, more complex reality. So how do, we in how do our interior worlds interface with reality, quote unquote. Uh, since we never relate to the world in, in, in a pure sense, uh, play, can, play can serve as an interface to, to our surroundings, uh, sort of as an applied immunology, as Sloterdijk puts it. The simplifications that gamification <laughs> requires uh, are not exclusive to the digital realm. They are everywhere, and, and logging off will not reimmerse us in genuine reality. In this sense, games are environments that make it easier, easier to see the world as a set of nested and, and layered and even sort of composited realities. If war gamification leverages game theoretically sound neoliberal mechanisms, forcing agents within labor markets to war against one another, new types of world games can and should posit new methods for coordination and, and regenerative resource supply. Um, so how do we re reclaim our agency through, through world games? I think Donna Haraway says it best when we need to stay with the trouble. And then just one last personal strategic note, um, only that which can change can continue. Thanks.